Cool. So this is what, this is what we're going to talk about today. What we just did was a little bit of qualitative and quantitative research. So basically, I counted down the number of people that raised their hands and were able to read. And I was looking at your faces, and some people were like squinching their eyes and trying to read. So if I had only trusted in the, on the people doing this, I would say, nobody can read it. If I had only trust in the people that raised their hands, I was like, 35, 40% of the people would be able to read. So, but either way, uh, any of those answers is uh, a good answer alone. You need both quantitative and qualitative. And this is what we're gonna talk about today. So let's get started. Oh, not this one, back. So today we're gonna talk about what uh, the structure is, what, why, and how on designing with data and data-driven and being data-informed and uh, easy and cheap methods for user research that you can use in your product, your startup, in your company, or in whatever product you're building. So let's get started. Uh, I'm Pedro Marquez, like I said, and I'm a product designer. And the fun thing is, design titles, they change like every six months or something. I think I have to, I have to set a reminder to update my LinkedIn every time, like, oh, what is the title now? And then I go there and update or something, because they keep changing. And then I, I did what everybody does. I ask my parents on, hey, dad, what do I do? He's like, design, right? True. And I asked my mom, and she sent me a three-minute audio on WhatsApp, which is what moms do. And she gave a good explanation, also told me how my cousins are doing and all that stuff. So that's me. And that thing in the back, it's uh, Belo Horizonte, is the city I'm from. I'm from Brazil, and now uh, that's the city where I spend most of my time in my career. There, I worked with a bunch of startups, big companies, international companies, and uh, the city is called Belo Horizonte because it translates to nice horizon. So basically, that thing in the back, they're not clouds, they're like mountains. So whatever you look, you have a nice horizon. And now I'm in this lovely city, which is Amsterdam. I've been living in Amsterdam for three and a half years working at Booking.com, and I work in a, in a big range of products over there. I worked at the, with, when we acquired startups on helping them build products that bridge their product and our product. I work in our consumer psychology team on helping our, our users in the website to make the right decision at the right time. And right now, I'm working with uh, machine learning and recommendation, for, uh, machine learning and uh, AI for recommendations and ranking and this kind of stuff so you can find the best hotel room whenever you want to find one. So what is Booking.com? A lot of people think Booking.com is just like a small company in the US because for some reason, a lot of people think, think we are American, but we're not. So Booking.com has its headquarters, and it was born and raised in Amsterdam. We have about 15,000 15, people on staff. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. And we have 1.4 million, uh, we sell 1.4 million rooms per day. This number is probably a bit higher now. We have 1.3 million properties. When I say properties, I mean a hotel or a, or a home or a stay away or a, any kind of properties that you can stay in. And uh, we are 150 designers strong, and we test everything, literally everything. Every single pixel in our website, every position of a comma, every color, every text box, every input, every flow, we test everything. Uh, I like a quote from our product our, our design director that booking.com is basically just a yellow box with the form and some stuff around. But in the end, it's just a yellow box, because that's what it is. That's what you have to get done. So design at booking.com, yeah. First slide, I said there were 150, right? So that slide I did from the first time I gave this presentation, which was like roughly a year ago, no, less than a year ago, and now we're 250. So we're a lot of people, and what do all those people do in, in just like one website or one product? Um, what do we do? We, we design, which is, Okay, right. But uh, we design in a different way. We are a different breed of designer, I'd say. We are the, what people call like the new, uh, the new designer, which is the one that can identify a problem and build a solution. Not just build a nice user flow, not just build a nice wireframe or user task. We, we can go from ideation to pr uh, production ready code and just get the thing out of the door as fast as we can so we can iterate in our product and learn and learn and learn and learn. 
When I say the new designer, I say it because of this. Uh, there is a report called, it's called Designing Tech. Uh, last year, it's is made by John Maeda. He's a, he's a design VP, he's VP of design of Automatic, the company that builds uh, WordPress. And uh, every year he releases this Designing Tech report. And uh, last year, he introduced these concepts, which I really like. So basically, in the past, we had the classical design, which is the industrial revolution on why design became a thing. It was everybody's industrial revolution is there. Everybody can build pro products at scale. But what differs one product to the other? Then the Germans and, this, and the Swiss, they start investing a lot in design. And that's where the classical design started. And then. We move on to design thinking, when you started putting this design mindset into business. So it was the need to innovate. So you see that the needs shift throughout the years, and the way we design also shifts. So, and nowadays, he has this term that I really like, so another title. Uh, it's called computational design. And what does this mean? It just means that we have the need to optimize. We need to optimize things, and things, you need to optimize them very fast. Because our customers are coming and going, our, our product is up and running, and uh, all the way here in the classical design, if I design a chair, and it has like a, a broken thing, and then the, the chair seems like doing this, all the chairs, what do you have to do? You have to do like a recall. You have to call every, like get everyone that has the chair, get it back, then fix it, and put it back again. That's a huge cost, it's logistics. It's a bunch of things. Nowadays, if I see something broken in a website, I just SSH to the server, you know, fix it, git commit, boom, it's there, period. So we need to optimize, and we need to optimize very fast. And this comes with something else, which is data. Data is a hot word in the industry. Uh, we're joking uh, in, in an event we went that if whenever time you hear any of these words, you drink a shot, you'd be drunk in like in halfway to the first stock in any conference nowadays. Because it's, in, I'm, not, I'm not diminishing them, I'm just saying that they're very important and we need to talk about them. And don't do this drinking game in my presentation, otherwise you get drunk in like 10 minutes. So, because I'm gonna talk about all these things. So you have A-B tests, you have performance, positive and negative uh, conversion in this and this, quantitative, qualitative, functionality, leads, optimization, conversion, all those words, and those are words that the product managers in the audience are probably used to because of filing the reports and reporting back to product directors and just reporting back to their team, we need to improve on this and this and that. So these are things that we need to take a look at and design based on those things. And, but at the same time, we need to keep paying attention to our users. So how does one design with data? What does this mean? Designing with data means using a bunch of things to uh, guide your design process. For example, one of them, historical data. What is historical data? What has been tried? What has been done? What were the learnings? Whenever you try something, the most important thing and the most boring one to do is documentation because nobody likes to write documentations, but they're very important because Nowadays, uh, we designers are booking. In your first day, you get in the office, you get, the, you get your badge, and you get like a, a, your key to the warehouse, and you have free access to everything that has been done in the company. We are a 20-year-old company, and we have been A-B testing for 12, I think. So we've been A-B testing for a long time. And I can go there and just go all the way to the first A-B test that was made in the company and see what was tried, what were the learnings, and how user behavior shifted. And that at that time was more rudimentary. Now we have a way better tool that tells, tells us a better story. But documentation is really crucial. And if you have this, and if you give your designers and everyone in your company access to this, you will be successful. Because people are led by ideas not to move a metric. So if you tell them, like, hey, this is what happened. This is what we tried. This didn't work because of this and that. How can we make it work? So historical data, it's very important when designing with data. Uh, this song wasn't, wasn't me. So models. Models are another thing, also hot word in the industry. Uh, as nowadays, I'm, I'm working on a machine learning team. We are developing a bunch of models just to try and predict and understand what the user, not what the user is doing, but what they did before. So I know that a person that books this specific kind of thing, this person went to this, this, and this, and this process. They care about this and this and that. And from that, we can abstract and apply these models to try and predict what they're going to do 
when they do the first thing that we, we saw that they did. So I, if I see that, oh, everyone that does this specific thing, that books this kind of properties, they, they search for, they filter for breakfast, and they go and look for breakfast photos, and we know that it's important. So as soon as we have the first indication, you can just go and change your design flow, change how your product behaves to that specific set of users. Another one is KPIs. So uh, probably it's a, very, it's a very known thing by nowadays, like probably everyone who works with their KPIs. So everyone has a target, everyone has a metric, and this metrics guide where guide uh, tell wh whether your company is doing great, doing fine, doing poorly, or you can, if you can do a better job. But just designing for a specific metric is not enough. Uh, there, is a, there's a, there was a quote, I don't remember the guy, but he says like, uh, it's some, someone's law, like if, if, a, if a metric becomes a target, it ceases of being a good metric. So we have to take a look. If you want to move a specific KPI, what can, we do to, what can we do to move it forward? What can we do to improve it or decrease it? Like if you want to decrease cancellations, if you want to increase the number of people booking a specific, a specific type of thing. So these kind of things and giving this data to your, to your team uh, will help them succeed. Usage. Uh, so basically, how people use our website, how they, how they, what they click, what they hover, what they, what they buy, or why, or which tasks they accomplish. If it's a task-based software, what they, what is the, what's everything they done before they accomplish that task. So analyzing this usage and having it well documented uh, will, will improve the, 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 the outcome of the, of the, of the design that you're working on. I didn't make the question, but who is a designer here? Raise your hand. A few. Who's a product manager? Oh my God. I can smell Jira tasks. <laughs> so yeah, if you provide this to your team, if you are, if you being a product manager, you like, you don't want it. Leading, the, having the responsibility to lead the team, to give your team all the tools that they need to succeed, so you can succeed and the company can succeed. So taking a look at all those things and providing these to your team, it's going to prove it, prove, uh, prove a lot of, uh, prove itself, prove having a lot of value. But all these things, they're just hard data. Remember in the, in the beginning, like the people that raised their hands? If I just counted that, I was like, okay, these people can read. But maybe at the same time, what well, the same person that raised their hand that's like, oh, I can read, had to like squinch their eyes and try to read like real hard, and they made it. They read, they read the, the message. But is that the experience that we want for our products? Is that, the, is that what you want your, your customers to be like squeezing their eyes to try and read something? That's not what you want. So quantitative data, uh, it will help you fill in the gaps. It will help, tell you, it will help you to tell the full story. At Booking.com, we have some design values that go hand in hand with the way we work. So one is this one, design for people. So not designing for a metric, not designing for a specific goal. You design for people. They will accomplish what they, what they want. If they are in your product, they, they, they want to do something, and you just design it for them, for them to make, to make the, the process easy for them to buy their product, to use, to accomplish a task, or to do whatever you want them to do in your product. Come on, clicker. So design is a team sport. Why do we say that? Uh, a bunch of companies, they have like a, I'm not saying this wrong, a bunch of companies have like the, their design team and they have their product management team, they have their development team, and by doing that, you're putting those people in silos and they are creating their, they're gonna be like the small groups like, oh, we are designers, we know what you're talking about. Oh, we're product managers, we know what a company needs. Like, oh, we are developers, we know the way to implement. But if you don't put these people together working, they're not gonna accomplish anything. Each of them are going to be accomplish their own goals, and in the end, you're just going to end up with like a tangled up mess of things you're trying to solve. Oh, for example, a book in our teams are small startups. So in every team, we have a designer, a developer, a client side developer, or front end developer, a copywriter, a, product, a PO, a product owner, and a data scientist or a copywriter, depending on your team. So design is a team sport. It needs. It needs everyone to be successful. Not one player doesn't win. That doesn't win the the World Cup. I mean. Brazil lost like really bad last cup. I don't know if you remember. So one player doesn't win the cup. Do what's right, not what's easy. It sounds cheesy. It sounds like, yeah, of course. But it's easier said than done. 
doing what's right is really hard. When you, when you, when you head, head down like prioritizing what your team needs to accomplish, what you need to accomplish that day, you might tend to prioritize like the easy things just to get something out of the door, but is that what's right? Are you actually doing things towards a goal or just doing things for the sake of doing things? So doing what's right and now what's easy, it's a very good reminder that uh, we need to stick to our goals. And the details are in the design. Also, this is a, this is a more design focus, but it can be it can be applied for everyone. Just uh, just thinking. Don't think of like, oh, these are edge cases. These are things that we should not worry about now. Those are people you're building for. Don't call someone an edge case because I, I, I would not be. I'm not the, uh, like to be called an edge case. We like to call them like uh, stress cases. So they're cases that you need to stress a bit more to solve, but they're not edge because they're part of the product. So the details are in those things and the small things you build. And my favorite one that I've. I named this, stack, this task after, it's, which is informed by data and driven by empathy. Why? I just, we just talked through what you, the tools you need in order to design with data. All those things that we talked about, they're quantitative. And like I said, data doesn't tell the full story. So there is a difference between being... being data-driven and data-informed. And what is the different apart from that word? A lot of people, got, like, a lot of companies like to call themselves like data-driven, but I don't think that's the right thing, mainly because, let's say, we're data-driven. You make a test, the test returns results. It's positive, good. You go home, you go happy. If that's the only thing that we have to do, it's easy to just set up a randomizer of things and whatever works stays. And like, why do, we need, why do we need all those people here? Like, why do we need us? Why do we need all those 250 designers at Booking and basically more product, product owners? So why do you need those people for? You need those, we need them because they know a story. They know, they know what the, the goal is. It's not just trying things at random. Like I said, do what's right, not what's easy. So the problem with being data-driven is that you might end up optimizing the wrong thing. If you find a quick success in something and you swift, shift your focus completely towards that thing, that thing might be successful now, or you, and you can just like keep micro-optimizing that thing, but does it fit the bigger scope uh, on where your product wants to go? So maybe not. So not everything in this is an optimization problem. This is a quote by Andrew Chen. He has a very comprehensive article on data-driven and dating form, which we will link in the presentation when I send them out. So yeah, data is one of the tools. It helps fill in the gaps. And being data informed is this. So it's quantitative, it's qualitative, and a little instinct. Instinct might be a very vague thing, because it's like, I feel we should go that way, so let's go that way. I feel we should go that way. So instinct is not, might not be the best word to, to, put, to put there, but I mean, companies are paying us because they believe on the work we do, they believe on the things, on our ideas. Like you, you are a product manager or a designer, like, I believe that if you go, if you want to fix this problem, we need to go this way. Data is not going to tell you this. Data is not going to give you directions. Data is just going to give you, we give you answers on the questions that you ask. If you don't ask the right question, it's not going to give you the right answer. So this is being data, data informed. It's assuming that you don't know the full story. And this is hard. When you have like, to talk to someone like, I don't know the full story of this. I have to test, I have to talk to people, I have to gather qualitative and quantitative data, see where this fits in a company strategy or in the product strategy for the long term. It's, it's hard. You can, we know a lot of, I bet, I bet like everyone knows like that specialist that knows the answer for everything right away without thinking. Maybe not, because that's just the instinct part. You need all the rest. So a good professional that builds products for people and have access to this kind of data works on that spectrum, and if you find that sweet spot over there, you probably like Steve Jobs or something, but we float, we, we float, float towards a specific parts of this. So what happens when you're data-driven? This is a oversimplification, but what happens when you're just data-driven? There are two things. One thing is called the local, the local maximum and the global maximum, and what's the difference between them? Let's say I find a quick success. I, I'm 
I'm gonna be very, it's not a very good example, but let's say if I increase the size of the CTA by three pixels, people see it more, people click more, people buy more, awesome. What's the next experiment? I mean, what's the next task I should do? Increase it a little bit more, more three. Like, yes, that's great, they're, they're clicking more. What's the next step? Oh yeah, <laughs> a, big, a bigger CTA. So what I'm doing is I'm improving in my local maximum. The local maximum has, has a maximum, and that local maximum is not, is, it's never going to be able to uh, get to their full potential. So you need to give a little step back and think, okay, I see that increasing the size of the CTA by X, it's to help people click. But what is the real problem here? The real problem is the flow is broken, or the CTA doesn't have the proper attention, that there's way too, many, way too much things around the CTA. There's something there. It's not just people are not going to click something just because it's bigger. I mean, maybe. But uh, that's not the root of the problem. So to dig into the root of the problem, you need to be comfortable with this thing, which is whenever you accept that you don't know the full story and you want to try and test that thing, you, mi you might. You, the ch there are chances that you will like get it right in the first time, and hell yeah, like I reorganize the page and reorganize the flow, boom, success. But this, <laughs> we all probably know that we don't get things right on the first try. So accepting the little dip that is, is statistical. This is like the, 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 the article from Andrew Chen has a very good explanation on this. You're never gonna reach that point. And how do you reach that point? You reach that point knowing that you want to go to that point and accepting the ups and downs of the process, but still keeping, in, keeping you, you and your team in check on the process, that you, on, the process on, the, on where you are in the process and the results that you bring in. So how do we do this at Booking.com and how you can do this in your product? Like, like I showed before, like we have a massive scale so I can run an A-B test, like literally like just changing where the comma is in a phrase, or just changing slightly the copy inside of a tooltip, and I can have a statistic significance that my change, sorry, that my, the thing I change actually move these specific metrics, because we have that much traffic. As you, as you saw, like 1.4 million rooms per day, and not everyone buys a room, so that you can, how many people you think that browse a website every day. So there are a lot. So you can have a lot of statistical significance. But how can you do if you don't have that much traffic? How can you apply those things in a smaller company or in a product that is not aimed for uh, the mass consumer market, which is like a tool or something that you have a smaller audience? It's this. This is also a word in a drinking game, because every design conference that you go, they will be talking about empathy. So we practice empathy. What is empathy? It's basically the ability to put yourself in someone else's place. So just go, try a product, and see like, what do people feel and what do they see when they're actually accomplishing this task. I fall in a mistake all the time. If I'm designing something I'm gonna test, it, I'll just go there and test my thing in isolation. Just like, okay, this thing, if I click, then it's gonna filter this way and this way, and awesome, great, works. I asked like a colleague, like, hey, does this make sense? Make sense, great, let's test it. But the user is not just gonna go in your website and land in your change and just work in that place. It's gonna, the, the user is gonna go to the entire flow. And there's, like, there's a lot of things that, things that he's learning in the first, the first time uh, he or she lands in the website and patterns that his brain is like, okay, so whenever we are in this website, whenever I do this, this happens, this happens, it starts creating these mental models. And if you design an isolation and you don't practice empathy, you will you might end up breaking, up breaking these models and not making use of them. And practicing empathy is very easy. One thing that you and I think most of the people can do in their product is using your own product. It sounds stupid, right? But uh, it, it, it's, it changes a lot. At Booking, for example, we have a program where uh, I can go like twice per quarter, twice every three months. I can travel for free, basically. I go to a place that I've never been before, that we have like specific cases, like a place you've never been before, a place where you don't speak the, the, the language. Sounds like now. Uh, a place where you don't speak the language. I can go, I can travel to that place. And what I have to do is basically go through the entire flow like a, like a normal customer, go through my phone and suffer all that pain. And then 
write a report and see where can we improve, where, where we shine and where we are total shit. So where, where can, what are the points where like, okay, this doesn't work, or I was expecting this to work this way. So using your own product is very important. So if you have a consumer market problem, a uh, product, start small. Give your one of your teams like a budget to try your product and see what happens afterwards. Measure. See, like we gave them this budget, they reported this thing, we fixed these things, now we have this metrics change and this and that. So I, I highly recommend you trying this in your product, whether that is a consumer market product product or whether it is a tool. And another way to do this is my favorite thing, which is user research. At Booking, we have where we designers were responsible for uh, conducting some some sort of research as well. But we do have a, a, an amazing user research team where they help us to conduct this kind of research, researches. These researches that I have here, they are all easy, cheap, like very cheap on time and cheaping actual cost, which is also time. So uh, I'm going to go through some of them and show you how we did some of this kind of, uh, this kind of studies. And now in the process, I will give you tips on uh, how you can do this in a smaller scale if you work in a smaller product, or in also in a bigger scale like we do. So one of them is online survey tools. We have, we have this button. Whenever you go to, the, to, like, to choose a room, we have this little thing that just goes like, hey, someone just booked this. And that's true. We were telling the people, like, hey, actually, someone just booked this room. So we're giving that person, um, um, we're giving that person uh, social, social uh, Jesus, what's the word? We're giving that person, we're telling them, like, hey, other people also like this. So it's some, it's, you're telling them, like, if other people also like this, if someone booked this, you might like it as well. It's not shit. Uh, we're giving them a little bit of urgency as well. It's like, hey, someone just booked this. So you... If there is another, we might have just five more, so it's, you better hurry. And a little bit of a scarcity as well. So we're playing with all these concepts just to give you an insightful information, but at the same time, helping you go through the flow and helping the company and everyone. Like we call this a win-win-win. So we are happy, hotels, our partners are happy, and the users are happy because they got the room they wanted. This message, um, I'm gonna ask you a question. Raise your hands if you think that this, when, when you see this, this happened roughly, I don't know, like one hour before, or if this happened in 12 hours before. So if you think this, someone booked this one hour ago, raise your hands. If you think 12, raise your hands. It's a very divided audience. And was a very divided research. So in the end, 58 of the participants understood that the, the, the message was in a one hour span. So I learned, and in the last hour or so, someone booked this. They weren't expecting me to tell like someone just booked this, like if it was 12 hours ago. But this was something that we had to fix because the actual message was for eight hours. So in an eight hour span, we tell you someone just booked this. Because the definition of just is very vague. And for, for me, Brazilian, for me, it's like, oh, just, I'm lazy. So maybe it was like a few hours ago, it was like yesterday or something. But if you're in a hurry, you might think like, oh, Jesus Christ, someone just booked this now. So what we did was, let's find a way to tell the truth, tell the, what we believe, to, to bring clarity to this, and show users what this really means. So this. So if it was less than one hour ago, someone just booked this. And when they hover that thing, it says like it was booked like 42 minutes before or whatever the time was. And if it was more than an hour, we say like, hey, it was this time span. It sounds like a silly change, right? It sounds like no brainer. But uh, these are the things that you actually get when you talk to your users. It's like, hey, I don't get this message. I don't see the full potential of this message. So we just make this. And this helps everyone, help the company, help the business, help hotels to make better, to get the rooms and people to make better decisions. So it's just, like I said, a win, 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 win. And a survey is super easy to do. You can set up a survey like a survey monkey, get your front-end developer to put like a little, little thing in your website and just like, hey, do you mind, after a user accomplishes a task, like, do you mind answering a quick survey on this? Do you mind doing this? Response rates are usually not super high, depending on the, how engaged are your audience with your product. If you like a, 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 a productivity pr uh, product, 
you probably got like a lot of responses because people have, lot, have lots of opinions on tools they use every day. But if like a consumer market kind of thing, maybe don't have, they don't have time, but they will respond. Some people will respond, and you'll get a lot of insights. Quick, cheap, easy, gives great insights. Another one is street level user testing. This is my favorite one. Um, the office in Amsterdam sits on top of, uh, one of them sits on top of a Starbucks. And what we do is we basically go to Starbucks and we're like, hey, person, because the thing is, you need to talk to your users, right? Like people that use your product. If you're in Amsterdam, in a city center on Starbucks, chances are you're a tourist. So basically, almost everyone that is a potential customer. So we just go downstairs, it's like, hey, if I buy you a coffee, do you mind using this product for a little bit and give me some feedback? I'm like, sure. Why not free coffee? Just like to use an app or something? So this is quick, easy, cheap. We ran into a little bit of a problem with Starbucks because they're like, dude, you just buying coffee to everyone now. Like, there's just a bunch of designers here talking to people. So now we have like a some sort of agreement, and we can like go like two people at max and bother the people there and stuff like that. But this is quick, cheap, and easy, especially if you have a mobile app. I, mean, I, I work with a mobile web and, uh, and a desktop web, so sometimes I just go there like with my computer, like, hey, use this, and I just. Can you, can you do this for me, and this and this, and like, oh, but what do you think of this, and this, and this, and that? So this is real, real, real cheap and real easy. And you could not believe how many great insights we had from this. So, highly recommend. Another one is uh, usability test. This one is a little bit more, let's say, expensive. You uh, we went full expensive. We have a usability lab inside a company that's now is moving to a separate building because we're growing in size. We have, like, you know those FBI rooms with the mirror where people, we, you have people behind the mirror like, and the people doing the task, they don't know that you're there, so it's awesome. So this is the case. So back in the, on the other side, there's a glass that the, the user thinks is a mirror, but in the other side, there's a user, uh, user researcher, and here are two designers, and they're just basically seeing uh, a streaming of the, of the page, of what they're doing. They're seeing eye tracking, and they're seeing also a camera pointing at the person's face, so the, they know like the reactions, maybe they're like, what is this, or something like that. So you can identify patterns on this as well. So we do this a lot. I don't know the frequency, but now as we're moving to a different building, that's because the frequency is high. And we just, I just sit there. I work there and doing other stuff and just watching these user research over and over and over again. There are several tools out there in the market where you can do this with your users in a remote way or in a, prison, or in a present way. There is a hot jar that you can, where you can conduct this kind of testings. There, are, there is a usability, user, usertesting.com, which is a tool that we also use. It's great, you can do like unmoder unmoderate uh, user tests, and it's quite cheap, and you can get users from all over the world, which is amazing, and you get results in like, in one hour, you have like 100 res results, so people are actually trying to get like recordings and all of that, it's amazing. So talking to users is the best thing you can do. The next one is uh, diary studies. What are diary studies? This, is, this one is a bit more complex, but it brings amazing results. What do we do? We have an agency that gets people to interested in being in a test. We don't just, we don't always just walk up into people at the street. We have a formal process to get in those people. So we, we're like, hey, can you get some, get, can you get for me someone that's willing to travel in the next, is planning to travel for the next month or something, and they get some, can they get some people, and we talk to them. The agreement is, we get their phone, we send an SMS every day, asking, hey. Did you do something about your travel today? If they reply yes, we ask. We, we ask, like, can we call you or something? And then we get the, what did you do? Like, oh, I searched for flights, and I did, did this. I searched for uh, what can I do in this place, like prices in which season. Great. Tomorrow? I don't know if it's, it doesn't need to be every day, but I think this, in this case was every day. So we did, tomorrow again, like, hey, did you, do, did you do anything regards to your travel today? Like, yeah, I did this and this and that, and how was this? Oh, it was frustrating. I was looking for this, I could never find, and yada, yada. So we followed through the, pro through the process until like, the, the person first thinks of doing, uh, of traveling, and we go all the way to the end until they come, when they come back home. Even when they are in the travel, we try not to bother them when they are traveling, but when, well, also, once in a while we catch up, like, hey, how is everything going? How was the checking in at the hotel? How was doing this and this and that? 
And the fun thing is, this study is conducted without them knowing we're booking.com. So in the end, a lot of people just end up booking somewhere else. They end up booking, I don't know, in, uh, in any other company that you can book hotels or accommodations. And this is great, because at some point, they, they probably ended up in our website, and they decided not to book with us. Why? So that's a great insight that we have. That's a great insight that we have. So from that, we generate a hypothesis. What's the difference between a hypothesis and an idea? Uh, people with ideas are artists, and people with hypotheses are designers. A hypothesis uh, is based on a fact. Like, I saw that this person does this at this point, and this person doesn't get this thing or act in a weird way, and I'm gonna try to, and I'm gonna do this because I think, I believe that doing this, this pe people will click more, people understand this more, people will buy more, people will spend less time in a page or more time in a page. So this is a proper hypothesis. After we, we generate a proper hypothesis, we define measurable metrics. Okay, I'm a designer, I design things, I make things like useful and nice and beautiful and delightful and yada yada, but how can I make, how, uh, how can I make sure that it actually works? And I should define these KPIs that we talked in the beginning. I define those, okay, I'm doing this change because I believe this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. Facts, hard numbers, qualitative, but based on my user research. See where we're going? See it? So um, my hypothesis for these slides is, if I increase the content, based on my user research, I saw that my current slide, my current slide uh, uh, opacity is too low because I saw people squishing their eyes. And uh, I also got a quantitative data that roughly 30% of the people were able to read. I'm gonna change my slides, bump the opacity to 100% because I believe that the readability of my slides is gonna reach about 90% because maybe there's someone in the back without the glasses or sleeping or whatever. So the readability and the consumption of that content will increase. This is a hypothesis with measurable metrics. After that, we prototype. When we prototype, we just go like, okay, we saw this in the research. We think this is the right way to, the right way to do. We prototype. <laughs> we go to Starbucks. We try it again. We try to prototype. Not good enough. Iterate. Try again. Prototype like in the company. Prototype with the user testing.com or anything like that. Just put it, put it in front of users before just getting hard data. After we prototype, we up oh, no 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 thank you Jesus Christ. We test, and after we test, uh, sorry, and we test like. Uh, in the case of Booking.com, like I said in the beginning, everything is A-B tested. Everything, every single thing, it's there for a reason. So after we test, we get the results back. What we do? We go back to the beginning, and that's the message that I wanted to, wanted to give to you all, is that listen to your users, gather data, and do this over and 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 over again. So I hope this was useful, and thank you. So yeah, I think you have time for questions, right? Yeah, actually, questions. So, questions, all the way in the back. Yep. Yeah, we can, uh, and we do. For example, we have a very fancy thing in the office, which is like a, a thing you put in the person's head, like really sci-fi kind of thing. And then, I forgot the name of it now, it's a neuro test. And we measure the, 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 their happiness or frustration in all, all those things throughout the flow. Sometimes people need a little, bit, little, a little push. If you just land in the homepage, you're not pushing to do anything, you haven't decided. But as you go through the funnel, if you get to like a really, a decision moment where we, th we, we believe that you need a push, uh, we, we'll just give you these incentives to, 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 to book and so on. If you see that over and over and over and over and over and over again because you're doing like extensive research on which hotel to pick, uh, it might get stressful, but hopefully we can balance this out after you book by giving you like 
giving you reassurance that you booked the right thing and that the time you spent was meaningful. So it's a matter of balance. But we do measure, and for example, the example that I show, we measured, we saw that and we, there was people getting too stressed because they were thinking we're too narrow of a time, but in the end it wasn't, and we fixed it by reducing that, that stress and but still keeping the metrics the way they were because we're giving clarity, which is as good as urgency or scarcity or any persuasion method that you could think. So yeah, we do, we do, we do worry about that, so and we test, and we always try trying to improve. That was the team that I worked last year for an entire year. I was basically working on these things. For example, those pop-ups of things, we don't have them anymore. I removed them. More questions? You. Very good question. The question was, uh, we run thousands of A-B tests at the same time, and uh, how do we cope with that? How they don't conflict with each other? How do people know what people are working? We have uh, the tool we use to A-B test. is built in-house, and is probably one of the best in the market. I'm sorry about this. It is very, it's very comprehensive, so whenever you're trying to do something, we have ways to tag, like, okay, you want to do something here? There are these other things happening here, they might conflict with each other. So, uh, and we have a, a group of people testing it as well, and so on. We don't do big tests. You're not gonna land in the homepage today, and then one week from now, you have like every single thing different, because that's not how it works. We try to test very small. Our teams are organized in a, in a journey way. So the, the, the journey that the user has to book is, what the is, is what, how the teams are organized. So you have the lending experience, you have the search experience, you have the comparative experience like by choosing properties, <coughs> you have the room selection process, you have the <coughs> booking process, which is like actually buying, uh, actually, actually booking the room. So the way we do is communication. Every team is, is in the, as we own this part of the product, let's say I work in room selection. Uh, the, the, there are several teams that work in different things in the process of room selection. We have a lot of, we, we talk a lot, we just like, hey, what are you doing, what are we doing in this? We have the stand-ups in the team and the stand-ups in the track, like what everyone is, is focusing on. So it happens. Sometimes it's like experiments or uh, tasks conflict, but it's like what we like to call like an organized chaos that works, and we rely a lot on communication. So it's a lot on, like, like I said, like design is a team sport thing. It's very important that everybody knows what is happening in the surroundings of the area of the product that you're, that you're working. Answer it? Great. Do you have time for more one? I think, I think we do. Actually, we have time for one more question. One more question. Someone? What? I really like it. I learned way more than the university, actually. I think that's the best part of it. Because oh, when I joined, like when they gave me the keys to the warehouse of data, I was like, what the hell do I do with this? <laughs> and like you have, uh, have an extensive mentorship program like with people helping you flow through the, to, to, to that data and helping understand, making sense of it. So I really, really like it because I learned so much. I can I can put on paper how much I learned uh, just on this on my first year there. And the rotation that helps a lot because you can get bored of just working like I uh, work on a search box for three years. But you move around so you work in other things. Wait, go, 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 go. Oh. There's a question. Wait, which one? Which one? There are two. I'll try to answer quick. Historically, we don't do releases. We do soft releases by testing feature by feature and seeing if that works. Uh, in the website itself, in the core journey, you will not see something completely new deployed, but you might see a completely new product deploy. Like for example, now, if you're depending on where you book something, you have, uh, we, you can book attractions. You can book like booking a fast lane, getting into the e Eiffel Tower, or you can book a cab that takes you from the, the the, the airport to the, to, the, to the accommodation. So we didn't do like 
big launches going in a stage Apple-like, but we do have bigger releases, but we mostly rely on, we believe that we don't do something that we can measure. If you release a big thing, if it works, you don't know what works. If it doesn't work, you don't know what works. You don't know what didn't work. So it's a matter of like, this works, okay, now bigger, now bigger, now bigger, and increase traffic and all of that. So that's basically how we release things. Hello, thanks for the presentation. Do you think that uh, Booking.com is like a system and why? Sorry, can you ask me again? Do you think that uh, Booking.com is ecosystem and why? Intersystem. Echo, ecosystem. Oh, okay. If I believe it, Booking.com is an ecosystem. Yes. It is actually, because we are, when we say Booking.com, like we see all those people, they're not just working on a website, because the website is just the website. But we have the website, the app, the mobile web, the tablet web, tablet app. We have products for hotels to manage your properties. We have products for, um, our internal account managers and so on. We have transportation products. We have a bunch of things. So this ecosystem lets people in with APIs and all of that. And uh, it fosters a community of other products and startups that are working with travel, like the startup hub that we have in Tel Aviv. So on this, we built this ecosystem of products and tech that works towards basically uh, going somewhere by booking an accommodation or experiencing, the, as we like to say, like experiencing the world. So we build, we're built on top of this ecosystem. Did I answer your question? Cool. Thanks, everyone. It was awesome having you here. I'll be sticking around all day, so just stop me and ask me whatever you want to ask. And Thank you very it. much. Thank you. Thanks.